Morning, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, friends. Welcome to Tallinn, a small city that nonetheless occupies an interesting place in the history of warfare. Back in June 1219, up on the Dome Hill here in Tallinn, which if you turn this off, I can show you where it is. On the back, <clears throat> back in 1219 on the Dome Hill, we Estonians were fighting the Danes, one of many peoples to invade us. The battle was going well for us and badly for the Danes, and victory seemed imminent. But then, right when the Danes were about to give up, a flag with a red field and a white cross fell from heaven. Grasping the flag before it could ever touch the ground, the king took it in his hand and proudly waved it in front of his discouraged troops, giving them hope and leading them to victory and our defeat. The flag, known as the Danebro, are there any Danes here? Danes? Danes, yes, there's the Danish title. The flag, known as the Dannebro, is still the Danish flag today, the oldest flag in use in the world, born right here on the Dome Hill, that, thanks to the technological superiority of the Danes over the Estonians. Technology, in that case, divine, got the better of Estonia in 1219. Later, in Tallinn, which incidentally means Danish town, became a walled city with moats, towers, parapets, and portcullis gates, which was a fine way to defend the place against various invaders until gunpowder, rendering here, as elsewhere in Europe, walled defenses completely obsolete. As first-time visitors to Tallinn will certainly discover, this is the home of one of the largest medieval old towns in Europe. Not because Tallinn itself is so large, but because when the larger walled medieval cities of Europe were destroyed by aerial bombardment in World War II, Tallinn was partially spared because in the larger bombardment of 1944, the bombers missed. All of this, by way of introduction, is to say that when technology is unexpected or when the technology changes, old forms of defense and security simply become obsolete. This conference takes place two and a half years after the DDoS cyber attacks against Estonia in May of 2007. More importantly, since 2007, there have been similar attacks against Lithuania, Georgia, and Kazakhstan. But since you think, if you, lest you think it's simply a problem associated with countries formerly occupied by the Soviet Union, we should also point out uh, that government ministries and agencies, often defense-related in the US, Germany, France, and South Korea, have been attacked as well. This has helped put cyber attacks on the international agenda to a much greater extent than previously. The DDoS attacks, and I guess most of you know here, they're not particularly sophisticated or technically complex, were nonetheless of tremendous significance for several reasons. First, they were created, they were intended to create, in our case, uh, social unrest in response to domestic policies. Domestic policies that were enac enacted by a democratically elected government and therefore represent an attack against the democratic system. Secondly, they were clearly organized. Now you can read all kinds of nonsense about the, the attacks uh, in the press, but if you, uh, if you talk to our CERT, uh, as I did, and I said uh, when he had a graph of the level of attacks, and they, and they uh, s simply stopped at 
at exactly 2400 or 0000 GMT on the 9th of May, and knowing a little bit about computers and mathematics, I said, well, clearly not a stochastic process. There's no Gaussian curve. How could it stop discreetly like that? And he said, the money stopped. You mean the money stopped? Well, I mean, again, if you know about botnets, you know that you rent them. You know that organized crime rents them. So somebody was clearly organized enough to rent large numbers of bots or botnets um, on a historically completely insignificant day, May 9th, the day the end of World War II, and had it have it end exactly at 2400. But of course, this means nothing. And finally, um, and then of course, the last point has no implications for anything, but uh, the th final point is that there is evidence that attacks have been, in some cases, partially state-sponsored. Those of you familiar with the, uh, the U.S. or the rather report of the Cyber Consequences Unit, I don't know if Scott Borg is here today, but he was at the last conference, the Cyber Consequences Unit examining the cyber campaign against Georgia know that the organizers of the DDoS attacks against websites in that country seem to have advance warning of Russian military intentions. In a word, they were apparently coordinated with a country's military and so constitute a possible infringement upon national sovereignty and more alarmingly, I think, and perhaps not so much a legal issue, but in terms of security, may well illustrate a new stage in the development of cyber warfare. That is to say, a public-private partnership. What is most significant about these recent attacks is, are the issues they raise and the weaknesses that they expose. These are no longer matters of theoretical abstractions, legal discussions, but real life issues that urgently require answers and they require action. We have seen evidence from, a technical, from the technicians and technical point of view that cyber attacks are growing more complex, moving beyond the relatively unsophisticated DDoS type. There are worrying signs that their use by state and non-state actors is growing, not diminishing. So, dear friends, we have to think. Modern societies rely on internet solutions. They have become an essential component of everyday life, of how we do business, of how we communicate, govern, and go about our daily affairs as citizens. For a country like mine, the internet has been a crucial motor of development and modernization that has allowed us to leapfrog from Soviet backwardness to cutting edge technology, the first, first computerized elections to uh, probably a wider range of government services on the internet than anywhere else. 